Book Four, Part One of History of the Kings of Britain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Translated by Aaron Thompson and J. A. Giles. Book Four, Chapter One Julius Caesar Invades Britain. About this time it happened, as is found in the Roman histories, that Julius Caesar, having subdued Gaul, came to the shore of the Rutini, and when from thence he had got a prospect of the island of Britain, he inquired of those about him what country it was, and what people inhabited it. Then, fixing his eyes upon the ocean, as soon as he was informed of the name of the kingdom and the people, he said, In truth, we Romans and the Britons have the same origin, since both are descended from the Trojan race. Our first father, after the destruction of Troy, was Aeneas. There's Brutus, whose father was Silvius, the son of Ascanius, the son of Aeneas. But I am deceived if they are not very much degenerated from us, and know nothing of the art of war, since they live separated by the ocean from the whole world. They may easily be forced to become our tributaries, and subject to the Roman state. But before the Romans offer to invade or assault them, we must send them words that they pay tribute as other nations do, and submit themselves to the Senate, for fear we should violate the ancient nobility of our father Priamus by shedding the blood of our kinsmen. All of which he accordingly took care to signify by writing to Cassibelan, who in great indignation returned him an answer in the following letter. Chapter 2. Cassibelan's Letter to Julius Caesar Cassibelan, King of the Britons, to Gaius Julius Caesar We cannot but wonder, Caesar, at the avarice of the Roman people, since their insatiable lust for money cannot let us alone though the dangers of the ocean have placed us in a manner out of the world. But they must have the presumption to covet our substance, which we have hitherto enjoyed in quiet. Neither is this indeed sufficient. We must also choose subjection and slavery to them before the enjoyment of our native liberty. Your demand, therefore, Caesar, is scandalous since the same vein of nobility flows from Aeneas in both Britons and Romans, and one and the same chain of consanguinity unites us, which ought to be a band of firm union and friendship. It was that which you should have demanded of us, and not slavery. We have learned to admit of the one, but never to bear the other and so much have we been accustomed to liberty that we are perfectly ignorant what it is to admit to slavery. And if even the gods therefore should attempt to deprive us of our liberty, we would, to the utmost of our power, resist them in defence of it. Know then, Caesar, that we are ready to fight for that and our kingdom, if, as you threaten, you shall attempt to invade Britain. Chapter 3. Caesar is routed by Cassibelan. On receiving this answer, Caesar made ready his fleet, and waited for a fair wind to execute his threats against Cassibelan. As soon as the wind stood fair, he hoisted his sails, and arrived with his army at the mouth of the river Thames. The ships were now just come close to land, when Cassibelan with all his forces, appeared on his march against them. 
and coming to the town of Durabellum, he consulted with his nobility how to drive out the enemy. There was present with him Belinus, general of his army, by whose counsel the whole kingdom was governed. There were also his two nephews, Androgeus, duke of Trinovantum, and Tenuantius, duke of Cornwall, together with three inferior kings, Critius, king of Albania, Guertheith of Venedotia, and Britail of Domitia, who, as they had encouraged the rest to fight the enemy, gave their advice to march directly to Caesar's camp, and drive them out of the country before they could take any city or town. For if he should possess himself of any fortified places, they said it would be more difficult to force him out, because he would then know whither to make a retreat with his men. To this proposal they all agreed, and advanced towards the shore where Julius Caesar had pitched his camp. And now both armies drew out in the order of battle, and began the fight, wherein both bows and swords were employed. Immediately the wounded fell in heaps on each side, and the ground was drenched with the blood of the slain, as much as if it had been washed with the sudden return of the tide. While the armies were thus engaged, it happened that Nennius and Androgeus, with the citizens of Canterbury and Trinovantum, whom they commanded, had the fortune to meet with the troop in which Caesar himself was present. And upon an assault made, the general's cohorts were very nearly routed by the Britons, falling upon them in a close body. During this action, fortune gave Nennius an opportunity of encountering Caesar. Nennius, therefore, boldly made up to him, and was in great joy that he could but give so much as one blow to so great a man. On the other hand, Caesar, being aware of his design, stretched out his shield to receive him, and with all his might struck him upon the helmet with his drawn sword, which he lifted up again with an intention to finish the first blow, and make it mortal. But Nennius carefully prevented him with his shield, upon which Caesar's sword, glancing with great force from the helmet, became so firmly fastened therein, that when, by the intervention of the troops, they could no longer continue the encounter, the general was not able to draw it out again. Nennius, thus becoming master of Caesar's sword, threw away his own, and pulling the other out, made haste to employ it against the enemy. Whomsoever he struck with it, he either cut off his head, or left him wounded without hope of recovery. While he was thus exerting himself, he was met by Labienus, a tribune, whom he killed at the very beginning of the encounter. At last, after the greatest part of the day was spent, the Britons poured in so fast and made such vigorous efforts that by the blessing of God they obtained the victory. And Caesar, with his broken forces, retired to his camp and fleet. The very same night, as soon as he had got his men together again, he went on board his fleet, rejoicing that he had the sea for his camp. And upon his companions dissuading him from continuing the war any longer, he acquiesced in their advice, and returned back to Gaul. Chapter 4 Nennius, the brother of Cassibelaun, being wounded in battle by Caesar, dies. Cassibelaun, in joy for this triumph, returned solemn thanks to God, and calling the companions of his victory together, amply rewarded every one of them, according as they had distinguished themselves. On the other hand, he was very much oppressed with grief for his brother Nennius, who lay mortally wounded and at the very point of death. For Caesar had wounded him in the encounter, and the blow which he had given him proved incurable, so that fifteen days after the battle he died, and was buried at Trinovantum by the north gate. His funeral exequies were performed with regal pomp, and Caesar's sword put into the tomb with him, which he had kept possession of when struck into his shield in the combat. 
the name of the sword was Crokea Moors, Yellow Death, as being mortal to everybody that was wounded with it. Chapter 5 Caesar's Inglorious Return to Gaul After this flight of Caesar, and his arrival on the Gallic coast, the Gauls attempted to rebel and throw off his yoke, for they thought he was so much weakened that his forces could no longer be a terror to them. Besides, a general report was spread among them that Cassibelan was now out at sea, with a vast fleet to pursue him in his flight. On which account the Gauls, growing still more bold, began to think of driving him from their coasts. Caesar, aware of their designs, was not willing to engage in a doubtful war with a fierce people, but rather chose to go to all their first nobility, with open treasures, and reconcile them with presents. To the common people he promised liberty, to the dispossessed the restitution of their estates, and to the slaves their freedom. Thus he that had insulted them before with the fierceness of a lion, and plundered them of all, now, with the mildness of a lamb, fawns on them with submissive abject speeches, and is glad to restore all again. To these acts of meanness he was forced to condescend till he had pacified them, and was able to regain his lost power. In the meantime, not a day passed without his reflecting upon his flight and the victory of the Britons. Chapter 6 Cassibelaun Forms a Stratagem for Sinking Caesar's Ships After two years were expired, he prepared to cross the sea again and revenge himself on Cassibelaun, who, having intelligence of his design, everywhere fortified his cities, repaired the ruined walls, and placed armed men at all the ports. In the river Thames, on which Caesar intended to sail up to Trinovantum, he caused iron and leaden stakes, each as thick as a man's thigh, to be fixed under the surface of the water, that Caesar's ships might founder. He then assembled all the forces of the island, and took up his quarters with them near the sea coasts, in expectation of the enemy's coming. Chapter 7 Caesar, a second time, vanquished by the Britons. After he had furnished himself with all necessaries, the Roman general embarked with a vast army, eager to revenge himself on a people that had defeated him, in which he undoubtedly would have succeeded if he could but have brought his fleet safe to land. But this he was not able to do. For in sailing up the Thames to Trinovantum, the ships struck against the stakes, which so endangered them all on a sudden, that many thousands of men were drowned, while the ships being pierced sunk into the river. Caesar, upon this, employed all his force to shift his sails, and hastened to get back again to land. And so those that remained, after a narrow escape, went on shore with him. Cassibelan, who was present upon the bank, with joy observed the disaster of the drowned, but grieved at the escape of the rest. And upon him giving a signal to his men, made an attack upon the Romans, who, notwithstanding the danger they had suffered in the river, when landed, bravely withstood the Britons, and, having no other fence to trust to but their own courage, they made no small slaughter, but yet suffered a greater loss themselves than that which they were able to give the enemy. For their number was considerably diminished by their loss in the river, whereas the Britons, being hourly increased with new recruits, were three times their number, and by that advantage defeated them. Caesar, seeing he could no longer maintain his ground, fled with a small body of men to his ships and made the sea his safe retreat. And as the wind stood fair, he hoisted his sails, and steered to the shore of the Morini. From thence he repaired to a certain tower, which he had built at a place called Odnia, before his second expedition to Britain. 
for he durst not trust the fickleness of the Gauls, whom he feared would fall upon him a second time, as we have said already they did before, after the first flight he was forced to make before the Britons. And on that account he had built this tower for a refuge to himself, that he might be able to maintain his ground against a rebellious people, if they should make insurrection against him. Chapter 8 Evelinus kills Hirolglas. Androdreus desires Caesar's assistance against Cassibelaun. Cassibelaun, elevated with joy for this second victory, published a decree to summon all the nobility of Britain with their wives to Trinovantum in order to perform solemn sacrifices to their tutelary gods who had given them victory over so great a commander. Accordingly they all appeared, and prepared a variety of sacrifices, for which there was a great slaughter of cattle. At this solemnity they offered forty thousand cows and a hundred thousand sheep, and also fowls of several kinds without number, besides thirty thousand wild beasts of several kinds. As soon as they had performed these solemn honours to their gods, they feasted themselves on the remainder, as was usual at such sacrifices, and spent the rest of the day and night in various plays and sports. Amidst these diversions, it happened that two noble youths, whereof one was nephew to the king, the other to Duke Androgeus, wrestled together, and afterwards had a dispute about the victory. The name of the king's nephew was Hiroglas, the other's Evelinus. As they were reproaching each other, Evelinus snatched up his sword and cut off the head of his rival. This sudden disaster put the whole court into a consternation, upon which the king ordered Evelinus to be brought before him, that he might be ready to undergo such punishment as the nobility should determine and that the death of Hiroglas may be revenged upon him if he were unjustly killed. Androgeus, suspecting the king's intentions, made answer that he had a court of his own, and that whatever should be alleged against his own men ought to be determined there. If, therefore, he were resolved to demand justice of Evelinus, he might have it at Trinovantum, according to ancient custom. Casabalaun, finding he could not attain his ends, threatened Androgeus to destroy his country with fire and sword if he would not comply with his demands. But Androgeus, now incensed, scorned all compliances with him. On the other hand, Casabalaun, in a great rage, hastened to make good his threats and ravage the country. This forced Androgeus to make use of daily solicitations to the king by means of such as were related to him, or intimate with him, to divert his rage. But when he found these methods ineffectual, he began in earnest to consider how to oppose him. At last, when all other hopes failed, he resolved to request assistance from Caesar, and wrote a letter to him to this effect. Androgeus, king of Trinovantum, to Gaius Julius Caesar, instead of wishing death as formerly, now wishes health. I repent that I ever acted against you when you made war against the king. Had I never been guilty of such exploits, you would have vanquished Casabalaun, who is so swollen with pride since his victory, that he is endeavouring to drive me out of his coasts, who procured him that triumph. Is this a fit reward for my services? I have settled him in an inheritance, and he endeavours to disinherit me. I have a second time restored him to the kingdom, and he endeavours to destroy me. All this I have done for him, in fighting against you. I call the gods to witness I have not deserved his anger, unless I can be said to deserve it for refusing to deliver up my nephew 
whom he would have condemned to die unjustly of which that you may better be able to judge hear this account of the matter it happened that for joy of the victory we performed solemn honours to our tutelary gods in which after we had finished our sacrifices our youth began to divert themselves with sports among the rest our two nephews encouraged by the example of others entered the lists and when mine had got the better the other without any cause was incensed and just going to strike him but he avoided the blow and taking him by the hand that held the sword strove to wrest it from him in this struggle the king's nephew happened to fall upon the sword's point and died upon the spot when the king was informed of it he commanded me to deliver up the youth that he might be punished for murder i refused to do it whereupon he invaded my provinces with all his forces and has given me very great disturbance flying therefore to your clemency i desire your assistance that by you i may be restored to my dignity and by me you may gain possession of britain let no doubts or suspicion of treachery in this matter detain you be influenced by the common motive of mankind let past enmities beget a desire of friendship and after defeat make you more eager for victory chapter nine Cassibelaun, being put to flight and besieged by caesar desires peace caesar having read the letter was advised by his friends not to go to britain upon a bare verbal invitation of the duke unless he would send such hostages as might be for his security without delay therefore androgeus sent his son Scava, with thirty young noblemen nearly related to him upon delivery of the hostages caesar relieved from his suspicion reassembled his forces and with a fair wind arrived at the port of rutupi in the meantime cassibelaun had begun to besiege trinovantum and ravage the country towns but finding that caesar was arrived he raised the siege and hastened to meet him as soon as he entered a valley near duroburnia he saw the roman army preparing their camp for androgeus had conducted them to this place for the convenience of making a sudden assault upon the city the romans seeing the britons advancing towards them quickly flew to their arms and ranged themselves in several bodies the britons also put on their arms and placed themselves in their ranks but androgeus with five thousand men lay hid in a wood hard by to be ready to assist caesar and spring forth on a sudden upon cassibelaun and his party both armies now approached to begin the fight some with bows and arrows some with swords so that much blood was shed on both sides and the wounded fell down like leaves in autumn while they were thus engaged androgeus sallied forth from the wood and fell upon the rear of cassibelaun's army upon which the hope of the battle entirely depended and now what with the breach which the romans had made through them just before what with the furious eruption of their own countrymen they were no longer able to stand their ground but were obliged with their broken forces to quit the field near the place stood a rocky mountain on the top of which was a thick hazel wood hither Cassibelaun fled with his men after he found himself worsted and having climbed up to the top of the mountain bravely defended himself and killed the pursuing enemy for the roman forces with those of androgeus pursued him to disperse his flying troops and climbing up the mountain after them made many assaults but all to little purpose for the rockiness of the mountain and great height of its top was a defence to the britons 
and the advantage of higher ground gave them an opportunity of killing great numbers of the enemy. Caesar hereupon besieged the mountain that whole night, which had now overtaken them, and shut up all the avenues to it. Intending to reduce the king by famine, since he could not do it by force of arms. Such was the wonderful valour of the British nation in those times, that they were able to put the conqueror of the world twice to flight, and being ready to die for the defence of their country and liberty, they, even though defeated, withstood him whom the whole world could not withstand. Hence Lucan, in their praise, says of Caesar, Terrata quaestia ostendit Turga Britannia. With pride he fought the Britons, but when found, dreaded their force and fled the hostile ground. Two days were now passed, when Cassibelaun, having consumed all his provisions, feared famine would oblige him to surrender himself prisoner to Caesar. For this reason, he sent a message to Androgeus to make his peace with Julius, lest the honour of the nation might suffer by his being taken prisoner. He likewise represented to him that he did not deserve to be pursued to death for the annoyance which he had given him. As soon as the messengers had told this to Androgeus, he made answer, That prince deserves not to be loved, who is in war as mild as a lamb, but in peace cruel as a lion. Ye gods of heaven and earth, does my lord then condescend to entreat me now, when before he took upon him to command? Does he desire to be reconciled and make his submission of Caesar, of whom Caesar himself had before desired peace? He ought therefore to have considered that he who was able to drive so great a commander out of the kingdom was able also to bring him back again. I ought not to have been so unjustly treated, who had then done him so much service, as well as now so much injury. He must be mad, who either injures or reproaches his fellow soldiers by whom he defeats the enemy. The victory is not the commander's, but theirs who lose their blood in fighting for him. However, I will procure him peace if I can, for the injury which he has done me is sufficiently revenged upon him, since he sues for mercy to me. Chapter 10 Androgeus's Speech to Caesar Androgeus, after this, went to Caesar, and after a respectful salutation, addressed him in this manner. You have sufficiently revenged yourself upon Cassibelaun, and now let clemency take place of vengeance. What more is there to be done, that he make his submission and pay tribute to the Roman state? To this Caesar returned him no answer, upon which Androgeus said again, my whole engagement with you, Caesar, was only to reduce Britain under your power by the submission of Cassibelaun. Behold, Cassibelaun is now vanquished, and Britain, by my assistance, becomes subject to you. What further service do I owe you? God forbid that I should suffer my sovereign, who sues to me for peace, and makes me satisfaction for the injury which he has done me, to be in prison or in chains, it is no easy matter to put Cassibelaun to death while I have life. And if you do not comply with my demand, I shall not be ashamed to give him my assistance. Caesar, alarmed at these menaces of Androgeus, was forced to comply, and entered into peace with Cassibelaun on condition that he should pay a yearly tribute of three thousand pieces of silver. So then, Julius and Cassibelaun from this time became friends, and made presents to each other. After this, Caesar wintered in Britain, and the following spring returned into Gaul. At length, he assembled all his forces, and marched towards Rome against Pompey.
End of Book 4, Part 1book 4 part 2 of history of the kings of britain this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org history of the kings of britain by geoffrey of monmouth translated by aaron thompson and j a giles Chapter 11. Tenuantius is made king of Britain after Cassibelaun. After seven years had expired, Cassibelaun died and was buried at York. He was succeeded by Tenuantius, Duke of Cornwall, and brother of Androgeus, for Androgeus was gone to Rome with Caesar. Tenuantius, therefore, now wearing the crown, governed the kingdom with diligence. He was a warlike man and a strict observer of justice. After him, Cimbelinus, his son, was advanced to the throne, being a great soldier and brought up by Augustus Caesar. He had contracted so great a friendship with the Romans that he freely paid them tribute when he might very well have refused it in his days was born our lord jesus christ by whose precious blood mankind was redeemed from the devil under which they had been before enslaved chapter twelve upon guiderius's refusing to pay tribute to the romans claudius caesar invades britain cimbelinus when he had governed britain ten years begat two sons the elder named Guiderius, the other Arviragus. After his death, the government fell to Guiderius. This prince refused to pay tribute to the Romans, for which reason Claudius, who was now emperor, marched against him. He was attended in this expedition by the commander of his army, who was called in the British tongue Louis Habo by whose advice the following war was to be carried on. This man, therefore, arriving at the city of Portchester, began to block up the gates with a wall, and denied the citizens all liberty of passing out, for his design was either to reduce them to subjection by famine, or kill them without mercy. Chapter 13 Lewis Hamo a Roman, by wicked treachery, kills Guiderius. Guiderius, upon the news of Claudius's coming, assembled all the soldiery of the kingdom, and went to meet the Roman army. In the battle that ensued, he began the assault with great eagerness, and did more execution with his own sword than the greater part of his army. Claudius was now on the point of retreating to his ships, and the Romans very nearly routed, when the crafty Hamo, throwing aside his own armour, put on that of the Britons, and as a Briton, fought against his own men. Then he exhorted the Britons to a vigorous assault, promising them a speedy victory, for he had learnt their language and manners, having been educated among the British hostages at Rome. By these means he approached, by little and little, to the king, and, seizing an opportunity to approach, stabbed him while under no apprehension of danger, and then escaped through the enemy's ranks to return to his men with the news of his detestable exploit. But Arviragus, his brother, seeing him killed, forthwith put off his own and put on his brother's habiliments, and as if he had been Guiderius himself, encouraged the Britons to stand their ground. Accordingly, as they knew nothing of the king's disaster, they made a vigorous resistance, fought courageously, and killed no small number of the enemy. At last the Romans gave ground, and, dividing themselves into two bodies, 
basely quitted the field. Caesar, with one part, to secure himself, retired to his ships. But Hamo fled to the woods, because he had not time to get to the ships. Averagus, therefore, thinking that Claudius fled along with him, pursued him with all speed, and did not leave off harassing him from place to place, till he overtook him upon a part of the sea-coast, which, from the name of Hamo, is now called Southampton. There was at the same place a convenient haven for ships, and some merchant ships at anchor. And, just as Hamo was attempting to get on board them, Averagus came upon him unawares, and forthwith killed him. And ever since that time the haven has been called Hamo's port. Chapter 14 Averagus, King of Britain, makes his submission to Claudius, who, with his assistance, conquers the Orkney Islands. In the meantime Claudius, with his remaining forces, assaulted the city above mentioned, which was then called Caeperis, now Portchester, and presently levelled the walls, and having reduced the citizens to subjection, went after Arviragus, who had entered Winchester. Afterwards he besieged that city, and employed a variety of engines against it. Arviragus, seeing himself in these straits, called his troops together, and opened the gates to march out and give him battle. But, just as he was ready to begin the attack, Claudius, who feared the boldness of the king and the bravery of the Britons, sent a message to him with a proposal of peace choosing rather to reduce them by wisdom and policy than run the hazard of a battle. To this purpose he offered a reconciliation with him, and promised to give him his daughter if he would only acknowledge the kingdom of Britain subject to the Roman state. The nobility hereupon persuaded him to lay aside thoughts of war, and be content with Claudius's promise, representing to him at the same time that it was no disgrace to be subject to the Romans, who enjoyed the empire of the whole world. By these and many other arguments, he was prevailed upon to hearken to their advice, and make his submission to Caesar. After which, Claudius sent to Rome for his daughter, and then, with the assistance of Arviragus, reduced the Orkney and the provincial islands to his power. Chapter 15 Claudius gives his daughter Genuissa for a wife to Alvaragus, and returns to Rome. As soon as the winter was over, those that were sent for Claudius's daughter returned with her, and presented her to her father. The damsel's name was Genuissa, and so great was her beauty that it raised the admiration of all that saw her. After her marriage with the king, she gained so great an ascendant over his affections, that he in a manner valued nothing but her alone, insomuch that he was desirous to have the place honoured where the nuptials were solemnised, and moved Claudius to build a city upon it, for a monument to posterity of so great and happy a marriage. Claudius consented to it, and commanded a city to be built, which after his name is called Caer Glau, that is Gloucester, to this day, and is situated on the confines of Domitia and Lurgria, upon the banks of the Severn. But some say that it derived its name from Duke Loius, a son that was born to Claudius there, and to whom, after the death of Arvaragus, fell the dukedom of Domitia. The city being finished, and the island now enjoying peace, Claudius returned to Rome, leaving to Arvaragus the government of the British islands. At the same time, the Apostle Peter founded the Church of Antioch, and afterwards coming to Rome was bishop there, and sent Mark the Evangelist into Egypt to preach the gospel which he had written. Chapter 16 Averagus revolting from the Romans, Vespasian is sent to Britain. After the departure of Claudius, 
Arviragus began to show his wisdom and courage, to rebuild cities and towns, and to exercise so great authority over his own people that he became a terror to the kings of remote countries. But this so elevated him with pride that he despised the Roman power, disdained any longer subjection to the Senate, and assumed to himself the sole authority in everything. Upon this news, Vespasian was sent by Claudius to procure a reconciliation with Averagus, or to reduce him to the subjection of the Romans. When, therefore, Vespasian arrived at the haven of Rutupi, Averagus met him, and prevented him entering the port. For he brought so great an army along with him that the Romans, for fear of his falling upon them, durst not come ashore. Vespasian upon this withdrew from that port, and shifting his sails arrived at the shore of Totnes. As soon as he was landed, he marched directly to besiege Carpen Huelgoit, now Exeter, and after lying before it seven days, was overtaken by Averagus and his army, who gave him battle. That day great destruction was made in both armies, but neither got the victory. The next morning, by the mediation of Queen Genuissa, the two leaders were made friends and sent their men over to Ireland. As soon as winter was over, Vespasian returned to Rome, but Averagus continued still in Britain. Afterwards, when he grew old, he began to show much respect to the Senate and to govern his kingdom in peace and tranquillity. He confirmed the old laws of his ancestors, and enacted some new ones, and made very ample presents to all persons of merit, so that his fame spread over all Europe, and he was both loved and feared by the Romans, and became the subject of their discourse more than any king in his time. Hence Juvenal relates how a certain blind man, speaking of a turbot that was taken, said, Regum aliquem capies, aut de temino Britano decedit el viragus. A viragus shall from his chariot fall, or thee his lord some captive king shall call. In war, none was more fierce than he. In peace, none more mild. None more pleasing, or in his presence more magnificent. When he had finished his course of life, he was buried at Gloucester in a certain temple which he had built and dedicated to the honour of Claudius. Chapter 17 Roderick, leader of the Picts, is vanquished by Marius. His son Marius, a man of admirable prudence and wisdom, succeeded him in the kingdom. In his reign a certain king of the Picts, named Roderick, came from Scythia with a great fleet, and arrived in the north part of Britain, which is called Albania, and began to ravage that country. Marius, therefore, raising an army, went in quest of him, and killed him in battle, and gained the victory. For a monument of which he set up a stone in the province, which from his name was afterwards called Westmoreland, where there is an inscription retaining his memory to this day. He gave the conquered people that came with Roderick liberty to inhabit that part of Albania, which is called Caithness, that had been a long time desert and uncultivated. And as they had no wives, they desired to have the daughters and kinswomen of the Britons. But the Britons refused, disdaining to unite with such a people. Having suffered a repulse here, they sailed over into Ireland, and married the women of that country, and by their offspring increased their number. But let thus much suffice concerning them, since I do not propose to write the history of this people, or of the Scots, who derived their original from them and the Irish. Marius, after he had settled the island in perfect peace, began to love the Roman people, paying the tribute that was demanded of him. 
and in imitation of his father's example practised justice law peace and everything that was honourable in his kingdom chapter eighteen marius dying is succeeded by coilus as soon as he had ended his days his son coilus took upon him the government of the kingdom he had been brought up from his infancy at rome and having been taught the roman manners had contracted a most strict amity with them he likewise paid them tribute and declined making them any opposition because he saw the whole world subject to them and that no town or country was out of the limits of their power by paying therefore what was required of him he enjoyed his kingdom in peace and no king ever showed greater respect to his nobility not only permitting them to enjoy their own with quiet but also binding them to him with his continual bounty and munificence chapter nineteen lucius is the first british king that embraces the christian faith together with his people coilus had but one son named lucius who obtaining the crown after his father's decease imitated all his acts of goodness and seemed to his people to be no other than coilus himself revived as he had made so good a beginning he was willing to make a better end for which purpose he sent letters to pope eleutherius desiring to be instructed by him in the christian religion for the miracles which christ's disciples performed in several nations wrought a conviction in his mind so that being inflamed with an ardent love of the true faith he obtained the accomplishment of his pious request for that holy pope upon receipt of this devout petition sent to him two most religious doctors Faginus and Duvanus, who after they had preached concerning the incarnation of the word of god administered baptism to him and made him a proselyte to the christian faith immediately upon this people from all countries assembling together followed the king's example and being washed in the same holy laver were made partakers of the kingdom of heaven the holy doctors after they had almost extinguished paganism over the whole island dedicated the temples that had been founded in honour of many gods to the one only god and his saints and filled them with congregations of christians there were then in britain eight-and-twenty flamens as also three arch flamens to whose jurisdiction the other judges and enthusiasts were subject these also according to the apostolic command they delivered from idolatry and where there were flamens made them bishops where arch flamens archbishops the seats of the arch flamens were at the three noblest cities viz london york and the city of legions which its old walls and buildings show to have been situated upon the river usk in glamorganshire to these three now purified from superstition were made subject twenty-eight bishops and their dioceses to the metropolitan of york were subject dera and albania which the great river humber divides from lurgria to the metropolitan of london were subject lurgria and cornwall these two provinces the seven divides from cambria or wales which were subject to the city of legions chapter twenty faginus and divanus give an account at home of what they had done in britain at last when they had made an entire reformation here the two prelates returned to rome and desired the pope to confirm what they had done as soon as they had obtained a confirmation they returned again to britain accompanied with many others by whose doctrine the british nation was in a short time strengthened in the faith their names and acts are recorded in a book which gildas wrote concerning the victory of aurelius ambrosius 
and what is delivered in so bright a treatise needs not to be repeated here in a meaner style. End of Book 4 Part 2